Good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are. I hope you're having a good day. How's everyone's day going so far? Also, where are you watching from? I always love to see. Hi, hi. You're from Australia? That's so exciting. Hi from Canada, Chicago. Hello, everyone. Washington, California. We've got you guys from all over. I'm in Colorado. New Mexico, New Mexico is. From Texas, hello, hello. It's 5 a.m. right now. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's hard to uh, manage that. I actually lived in Australia for about a year and a half, and it was really hard to make time to talk to my family over here because of that huge time difference. From Sweden and Michigan, well, hello, everyone. Whoops. I try to fall over. All right, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, I want to help you guys troubleshoot. So... I get a lot of questions or people struggling with specific things, and I was kind of thinking today maybe I can try to my best to recreate some of the things that you're struggling with and then help you actually troubleshoot them. An art teacher in Sweden, more from Canada as well. Hello, hello. So why don't you guys let me know what you're struggling with, watercolor, and see me demonstrate my backup plan if you guys have no questions is that um, I want to do a little experimenting to show you how different surfaces for watercolor will capture the pigment and it'll appear different. More from Canada. Man, I really need to... I've been saying I'm going to look into shipping to Canada and things because there are a ton of, of you from Canada on here. So I really need to do that. The streaky flat wash. Perfect. Okay. As we get suggestions. Streaky flat wash. <laughs> You're all locked down for lots of painting time. Um, there's another question in here. Learn, um, teach young pupils how to use watercolors in an easy way. How to load paint on your palette. Now, when you say um, load paint on your palette, are you talking about mixing it up or um, just getting the color from here? How to control color and get keep it from mixing. I need I need a bigger piece of paper. I don't know what I was thinking. I grabbed a tiny little one. You know what? Instead of grabbing my scrap paper, I'm gonna grab this little notebook. Thank you, thank you. Um, this was a really nice notebook that Maureen sent me. And I'm gonna write down your questions here. never winds up being the amount or consistent. Okay. Oh, also, look, look what Maureen painted. How beautiful is that? She sent me one of her little paintings she did, too. All right, let's actually start, and we're going to start with two. So um, 
coating paint and water on your palette. Okay, so we're going to start with two. We're going to kind of start with the um, loading up paint slash mixing it and then the streaky flat wash. Okay, let me go grab a little um, mixing well and we'll get started. Okay, so this paint palette is the Culture Hustle Stuart Simple one. I can use some different ones if you guys would prefer. Uh, I've got a couple different options here, um, but I was going to start with this partially because it's just kind of a fun palette. Okay, so the very first tip for um, getting color from your palette and mixing it up is you always want to start with wet paint. See, these are dry like this. So if I were to take my brush and get it wet, and then I were to try to dip into one of these colors, I can get some color right away, but I'm kind of limited to what my brush can drag across. And I can actually get way more if I pre-wet my color. So let's give these a real good spritz and let's let them sit for a minute. Yes, we are, we're just getting started. Um, controlling blooms. Okay, that's another question. See if I missed any other while I was doing that. No, I walked away for, for a second, so maybe I just wasn't saying anything. All right, so if you actually let these actually sit, then you're going to, without with a dry brush, I can actually come in here and I can get way, 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 way more pigment. So you're going to be able to load up more pigment. If you actually let these kind of soak in, it's not going to ruin your paints because they'll just dry out. Even as we do this today, these are going to dry out during class. So you'll see that. Um, oh, this paint palette is Stuart Simple from Culture Hustle. So let's actually talk about like mixing colors. Yes, you can just kind of come over here and say, oh, I'm going to make a little bit of a purple by just touching some here. And I do this fairly often, but you're going to run out of this color. And it's going to be a little bit hard to control the amount that's here and things like that. So if you need to mix up large quantities of color, you either want to take advantage. A lot of palettes come with little wells that are deeper and things like that. Or you can get something like this, or you could even just go into your recycle bin and get some like old yogurt containers or something like that. Something that's going to be able to allow you to mix up a little more color. Yes, this is the pinkest pink guy. So um, this is a muffin tin mixing well. This one's from Michael's and they're only about $2. So this is one of my favorite supplies to recommend because it is pretty price nice. <laughs> All right. So um Let's actually just mix up a very basic blue color, and I'm just going to grab that same color I was kind of talking about before. And I'm gonna mix it straight into that water. Now you wanna make sure that you're really getting that mixed in there, because there's a chance one of your flat washes that's streaky um, could possibly be because you didn't actually mix it all the way in. And so when you go to put it on, there's extra amounts of that pigment that are stuck in your brush. So that's one possible reason you're getting a streaky wash. All right, so it sounds like we're having some sound issues. I apologize. I'm going to keep adding this in. Oops, I got a little more of that other color in there. I probably mixed up a little bit too much or um, sprayed these just a little bit too much, but that's okay. We're going to go with it because we don't have a specific color. Okay, so that's in general how I do this. And one of my tips for mixing up colors, mix up more than you think you need because you can always reuse that color for other things like this is a palette 
that's been drying. So as you can see, it's dry. But if I take a damp brush, I can just come back in here and now I can use this color as well. So the amount of water is going to depend on how much you're going to cover. Um, I have basically just covered the bottom of this little well, and this well is, let's get a little ruler so we can kind of see. This well is about two and a half inches wide. And I used about three sprays from just a spray bottle. All right, so this would probably cover, like, this would be enough to probably coat like a four by six or five by seven page. Um, and I don't necessarily need quite that much because we're not gonna do quite that much, but let's actually try to make a streaky wash and then let's try to fix it. <laughs> Paint you like one of your watercolor girls. Um, painting sand. Let me see. I'll think about that one. I'm going to write that down in my little notebook. Okay, so right here I've got some 140 pound Canson XL paper. This isn't like the best paper in the world, but this is one that I like to use for kind of daily painting and um, doing experiments and stuff because it's like a pretty nice quality paper that isn't way too expensive. You're still preparing? That's okay. That's okay. Okay, so um, flat washes, there can be a whole bunch of problems with them, and there are a bunch of different methods in order to do a flat wash. A flat wash, for anybody who is unaware, is trying to cover an entire area with one solid color. And you might think, well, that seems pretty simple. You're just going to take your brush and you're just going to kind of paint that around. But what happens, let's do that right here. What's going to happen is if you just kind of paint it around, in order for it to be a nice flat wash, um, you want to be evenly adding the color and water to the paper so that it can also be evenly drying at the same time. Let's see if I can remove some of these shadows. I don't know if I can. It's okay if you joined a little weight. We're really just kind of getting started now. Uh, would you also say that more that with more water, less control, but to cover more paper? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Let me think about that for a second. Maybe it'll click in a second. Anyways, when we're trying to cover one solid color, see how I did put that same color across all of this? But notice that there are these kind of strange areas that are starting to dry. And this is probably not what you were meaning by streaky as far as the flat wash, but this is another problem. So what happens is when we just place the color down and we're not being super methodical about it, and this is also sitting flat, what's gonna happen is the paper is gonna start to dry in some of the areas where you put a thinner layer versus a thicker layer. And then you're going to get some of these um, blooms and back runs where the pigment becomes attracted to the border between the dry and the non-dry area. I'm adding things down. So I do often tape my paper down, especially when I'm composing something. Since we're doing little experiments, um, I might do some taping down in a little bit, but for now I'm gonna just start on these bigger pieces so that we can do some bigger comparisons across. Okay, so there's a couple ways to do a flat wash. And if you're having a streaky flat wash, more than likely what you're doing is you're putting too much pressure on the brush. Let's see if I can demonstrate this correctly. Ooh. Let me see if I can also get all of this in frame. <laughs> so if you are doing a flat wash and you're trying to do the dip drip line technique, all right, my trying to have this um, be <laughs> all in frame is not going super well. This might be a little bit too big of something. But what you want to do is have enough water to cover the entire area. I'm going to be covering about a similar sized area here. And I'm going to demonstrate this first. I'm going to try to get the streaky thing. So 
If I were doing a drip line and I filled up my brush with a bunch of this color, and then when I was dragging this across, I was pushing really hard. And then let's say I ran out and I was like, there's enough um, color here so I can bring that across and then I'm gonna kind of push hard. Then I'll reload and push hard across. And you might think that's enough to pull across and I'm gonna push hard. What's gonna happen, and this would probably be a little bit more effective if I went a little further out, is you're going to start to get these streaks because if you're pushing hard with your brush, you're also going to be picking up some of the pigment behind it and that's going to create the actual streaks in there. You can see a couple of them. There's also a question about clouds. So I will put that, um, we will go over some cloud stuff too in a second. Now, the way that I like to do my flat washes, there's a couple ways, um, but one way I like to do them is that drip line technique. So the keys to this are going to be a few things. One. We want this to be at an angle because we want gravity on our side, so we want it to all fall down. We want to mix up a bunch of colors so we're going to have enough. We want more than what we need just in case we were to run out and kind of underestimate. Hello, hello. You can always tag me in videos if you've got questions or want to show me things. Um, and then the other thing is we want to use light pressure. So we want to think of it like we're laying it on top. Like you're doing a nice glaze and you're trying not to disturb what's underneath it. So see how we're getting, I don't know how well you can see, but there's definitely some of that streaking happening here and here. And if we wanted to do this where we would um, reduce the amount of streaking is we'd load our brush up with a whole bunch of water here, hold this at an angle, and then we're going to lay this down. So I'm just resting my brush and just letting the paint kind of fall in between, like the surface tension between my brush and the paper with the paint, just letting that happen. Then I'm gonna reload my brush, and again, I'm gonna be super light. Pull that down. This is at an angle, super light. I'm just laying my brush. It's kind of hovering in between the surface tension and the paper of that water. Pull that down. So if you're having a streaky flat wash, more than likely what you're doing is just pushing a little bit too hard. Now that I'm finally kind of towards the end, I can pull some of that down. And then I'm gonna grab a paper towel. Let me actually show this. Tap my brush off so it's dry. And then we're going to suck up the extra water. So if you don't have a good brush, let me let me see what's happening. Um, let me grab a different brush and let's see how well I can do that. All right, let me rest that. And I also like to, when I do flat washes, I let them dry at an angle. All right, let me try to find a brush that is not super great. I was thinking there would be one. There's one in the praying set that's actually pretty decent, but it's still a little harder to work with. Um, let me see. Where is it? Well, actually, I can maybe demonstrate with um, one like this. This might be something similar to what you have, one of these like water fill pens. Let's see. I'm going to turn this into something rise. So the angle technique will work on a larger scale for... Um, or something like a sky. I'm going to show you another option too in a second, but first let's try to see if this actually, what I was just talking about, works with a brush that is not quite as nice. Um, this is a smaller brush, so I'm going to work on a slightly smaller square here, but I'm going to do the same thing 
And this is definitely harder with this brush because the bristles don't move quite how I like them. And this does not hold as much water. So your brush size is going to really ver um, depend on how large of an area you're going to be able to do this successfully with. But you can achieve this with a light touch. I'm being super duper light and patient with this as I pull this down. Um, if you have like one of those really rough brushes or one of those camel hair ones, you're, you're going to have more trouble than this. Um, they are kind of the, the bane of my <laughs> painting experience. I almost always toss those ones out, or I turned a bunch of them into a crown. <laughs> Can you do washes without streaking without angling the paper? So here's the problem. Let's actually do this as a little experiment. I'm going to grab um, a little square of paper. <clears throat> that I'm going to set over to the side once I'm done with this so that it can dry. So let's try to do that same thing, the flat wash. Oops, let me grab that extra water so we don't get too many of those back runs because that's another thing that's going to happen. If you leave water at the bottom, you're going to get back runs. Can I look at your art? Yeah, I encourage everybody to send me pictures through Instagram and things like that. I love seeing it. You're good at drawing, but can't paint to save your life. Well, you're kind of in a uh, an elite class. A lot of people are not great at um, drawing, but pretty decent at painting. I do have a few tips. Um, all right, so let's try to do that same drip line technique when it's not at an angle. We need gravity on our side because, see, it's not going to pull it down, and it's pooling. So there's a bunch of that pigment and it's pooling there in certain areas. And then as this sits, even if I had this taped down, it's gonna to start to buckle a little bit. So there was a question about buckling earlier. And some of that might be the paper you're using. If it's really thin, it's gonna buckle more, but um, it's just gonna happen a little bit naturally. It will start to settle down once it dries a little bit more. But we're going to just let this sit. So this looks like a pretty nice flat wash, but notice how much heavier some of this pigment is on the sides here. And as this sits, it's going to start to pop up a little bit. So we're just going to kind of let that one be and just not do much of anything else. Drawing feels so much more controllable. Blue nail polish is just Sally Henson Royal Hue, if anybody... I get more compliments on this nail polish than like anything in my entire life. So if you if you need a little pick me up and you need some compliments, this nail polish, I recommend it. Okay, so um, I'm getting a little off track. Let me do one more technique for flat washes that's really good for larger scales too. All right, so this is like the one time I reach for a different brush. Um, for most of my painting, like 95% of what I paint, I do it with this single brush, including small details. You just want to find a round brush that has a super nice point on it. But for doing a larger area, and if you're having trouble with streaking, this is another way to try to combat some of this, is to do a wet um, wash. And what you actually want to do is start by loading your brush or a flat wash. You can technically do this with a smaller brush too, but this is a lot faster. And if you're working in a larger area, you want to go faster. So what we want to do is actually pre-wet our paper. So I'm just putting water here. I'm going to put it kind of in this little square here, or rectangle area here. We'll go a little bit bigger too. And we want to wait... Um, we want this to be nice and evenly wet, so let's see if I can get some of the reflection there. Can you see how in certain areas there's way more water and in other areas there's less? So you either want to move that around or you want to re-wet certain areas and then um, soak up water from other areas. We want to have some shine, but we want to really start to see the texture of the paper through it. So let's give this a second to settle down. How did I make the cup of blue I'm pulling from? 
I can go over that again in a second. It's not a silly question. All this stuff, you know, when you start with a new art form, it can seem so intimidating because there are so many different things to, to learn. And sometimes when you learn them, you're like, oh, well, of course. But, you know, if you've never done it before, that's exactly what I'm here to help with. All right, so I've pre-wet this area, and then I can dip into this blue that I've made, and I can just put it right on that pre-wet area. And because it's pre-wet, it's going to be more forgiving, and even if it looks a little bit streaky at first... It's going to kind of settle itself down a little bit um, as you move it around. And then you want to stop moving it before <laughs> too much has happened because it's going to soften all those lines and things because the paper is already wet. But notice something here. So here's the reason why I don't typically like to do this type of a wash, even though it's technically easier, is it's not necessarily faster because the ultimate color you're going to end up with is desaturated because you just put it on top of other water. So you might have to do multiple layers in order to achieve the color that you ultimately wanted. Um, you could play around with knowing how much more saturated you need to make your color to compensate for that, but it's still, it's a little bit of a risky game. So that's one, that's one where you can get a nice smooth coat. Notice how smooth, even though I, the way I placed it wasn't super smooth but it's just so much lighter than the other ones. Oh, I'm sorry you can't come every Saturday. I do upload them afterwards if it saves. Okay, so next up, while we're kind of on this for clouds, um, let's talk about making some nice fluffy clouds. Hello, Japan. I don't think I've ever had anybody join from Japan before. That's exciting. Okay, so my favorite way to make clouds is by lifting color out. And I do this in a couple different ways. Um, if you're going to try to um, make your color or um, lift out with me, you're going to want to grab some paper towels. And you know what? I actually need to mix up a little bit more. So let's go back to that silly question. I don't think it was a silly question, but let's go back to that. So the way that I got that color was I simply put some fresh water and I usually use like a spray bottle or I sometimes use a pipette and then I just put enough water in there like one or two sprays extra because um, I already had some in there. And then um, what I do is I've pre-wet these colors here so that they're a little bit wet already. And then I can just dip into them, take that pigment on my brush, and then just mix it in to where I put that fresh water. And then I save my old um, failed paintings or the scraps, the um, ones that I cut off, so I have a little tester strip so I can actually see what the color looks like because it's going to look different than in there. So is it okay if you use a napkin? Um, yes. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways. I'm actually working on a video currently on all the different ways to lift. You can use sponges, you can use um, napkins, you can use all sorts of stuff. But um, for this method, I recommend having some sort of a paper product. So if we want to lift out some clouds, the first thing I do is I take one of these pieces of paper towel, scrunch it. Scrunch it up, and then I'm going to tear it. So if you've got a napkin, you could do the same thing. But what we want is kind of this messy, scrunched area that has these naturally ripped fibers, because that's going to give us some really interesting texture. All right. So here's my favorite, favorite way to do clouds. There's also a question about clouds and reflections. I'm trying to keep track of all your comments, by the way. I'm trying to um, pick ones that kind of go with <laughs> some sort of a direction. So if I haven't gotten to one, you can always ask it again in a little bit, and maybe I can do it then. All right, so we're going to start the same way. I'm going to do this at an angle. And one thing, if, if you're having trouble working on an angle because it's uncomfortable for you to hold this, every once in a while I get a little bit of, like, mild carpal tunnel or something feelings in my wrist. 
And that's when I pick things to like prop stuff up against so that it's at an angle and I don't have to hold it. So you can also do that. Well, hello to Spain. All right, so I'm gonna start, we wanna work kind of fast with this. I'm gonna start by um, doing a little drip line thing here. I'm not gonna be super duper careful. Clouds are also a really good way if you got done, like you're doing one of those little mini mountain paintings or something like that, and you're getting towards the bottom and you're thinking, oh, that's going to be really streaky. Consider throwing some clouds on it because it'll help disguise it. Whenever you get to the bottom of an area, you always want to suck up that extra water if you're trying to avoid those back runs or blooms. And then while it's still wet, I'm going to take that crumpled up piece of paper towel and I'm just going to press and lift. I'm going to move it. I'm going to scrunch it in a slightly different way to kind of affect the shape. And on some of them, I'm letting it sit there for a little bit longer. In some, I'm just going to tap so it's a little bit less. And that's going to kind of affect how much of that pigment that you actually pull up. So you can get some fun clouds just by using the scrunched off part of the paper towel. The reason why I have you scrunch it is because if you just took the side here, you're actually going to get the pattern from whatever is imprinted onto the paper here. Okay, so for shadowing on the clouds, there's a couple ways to do kind of like darker clouds. Um, I, Sunny, I don't know if I'm gonna entirely answer your question right now, um, but I'm gonna show you two possible ways to do some shadowing. Um, one is going to require us to let this dry and we're gonna come back to it. Uh, the other one is going to be a wet on wet technique. So if anybody is on here and you're like, I don't know what a wet on wet technique is, let me go over this. So you can actually, most of the things we've done besides this one here, were wet on dry techniques, meaning we took wet paint, put it onto dry paper. On this one, this was a wet on wet where we put wet paint onto wet paper and it has some different effects. You got the clouds to show up? That's so cool. Oh yeah, this box. It's an old C's candy box. And I've got watercolors in it. I got this, this idea from Christy the painter. I've got some of my watercolors. I've got some of the Burgette pigments in here and some of the Dreamland calligraphy and then some Daniel Smith ones. get that closed off. But yeah, this used to be a chocolate box. It had toffees in it. I don't know how old it is. Does it say? Mm. No. It does not say. North Carolina, hello, hello. All right, so next thing we're gonna do is, we're, so we're talking shadowing on clouds here. And you can do shadowing on clouds in a couple ways. One, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on it uh, layering here. And what this means is we need to let this dry completely. Now, if you were impatient, you could take a hair dryer and let it dry or dry it off so that it would be done fast. If you're brand new to my classes, I try not to use a hairdryer in my class so that I don't, um, I like this to kind of be a mildly peaceful time. And I feel like that's not a nice um, sound, as well as this is gonna give you a good idea of in real time how long it takes. And then we can also work on other things while we're waiting. So we need to prep a couple things for this next one. We're gonna be doing a wet on wet technique. So we need to have enough of this color to actually coat the page. We're going to also need to be very cognizant of how much that color has soaked in so that we know when we add it, it's going to spread the amount we want. We also need to make sure that we stop working before it starts to dry too much. And we also need to prep on our palette the color that we want. So for these types of clouds, there's gonna kind of be like little streaky poof clouds kind of a thing that are darker. And what I wanna do is we could do this with like a dark blue or a black, or maybe we could actually mix up a couple. But I'm going to take my damp brush and I'm going to um, 
dip it into a couple of these colors. So I've got a black and then kind of a blue. And I want these to be wet and kind of thin here. So I'm going to kind of thin that out because what I want to do is when, when it is time, and I'll show you in a minute when it's time, but when it is time, I'm going to take just a little bit of this. So we want to not have too much loaded. See how there's not that much on my brush. Ultimately, it's kind of just a little bit concentrated in the tip. And we're going to want to be able to have better control. And so by kind of spreading it out across a nice flat surface, we're going to have a better chance of getting the right amount of pigment in our brush. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I have not done this technique for probably like a year. So um, I might be a little rusty at this. Um, so we'll see if it works, but yeah, if we were to try to dip into this, even if we're careful, we're going to get a lot more pigment on accident. Where do I get my paints from? Um, from a lot of different places. This one is culture hustle. Um, I personally have a palette that I like, um, that I sell. I also like Viviva and then I like a couple other ones too. The Koi one is also a really good kind of beginner level palette as well. The dried ones, not the tubes. I don't like the tubes. And I think Koi is widely available. I think you can get it from Blick, Jerry's, Amazon, Michael's. All right, so I've got a clean brush here. I'm going to do the same drip line technique. And then we're going to grab that palette again. We're also going to be needing a reflection. So if you're doing this one live with me, make sure you've got a good light source next to you so that you can see the reflection. I'm going to move a little bit fast. Okay. All right. So notice when I have this reflecting, see how we can really see the texture up here is the perfect place for that to add down here. It's still a little bit wet. So I'm going to kind of work from the bottom. So I'm going to grab some of this color that I grabbed or made here where it's kind of thin. I'm going to tap my brush off so I don't have too much. And then we're just going to tap our brush in here and we're just depositing the color. Now see if I try to put this up here, it's too dry. See how in certain areas it's not going to move at all. Um, but we can kind of tap that color in here. We can take a little bit more if you wanted to be a little bolder. And while it's that kind of slightly shiny, but you can see the texture through, you can deposit some of this color in there. Now if I were to try to put this down here where there's a ton of water, it's going to kind of move. See how you can actually get it to move around. Um, and that's not necessarily going to help you with placement, but you can kind of see when I added these, let's look at a couple of these here. So this is about the uh, dryness that I wanted it to actually be in order to get that over here. It was close, but it was starting to dry from above. So we're going to get some of that bunching of the pigment there. And this one, it was definitely too, too dry. You can actually just see directly where I placed it. There was not much bleeding at all. And then I'm going to suck this up at the bottom here. So um, this is one way to get kind of shadowy clouds is to do this this way. So this is a really good thing to practice. There was also a question earlier about color control on the page and keeping it from mixing. So one thing you can do and let's play with this for a second while we're still waiting for this one to dry um, is play around with adding color on your page. So let's make a little box here and let's get it super duper wet. Okay, this is so wet that if I were to hold this up to the reflection, you can actually see the water moving around on the page. And then if I were to add some color in here, I have no real control of where that's going to go because it's going to flow with the water on the page. Let's put another color on there. Oops, that's quite a bit of that. And this is just going to kind of move around on the page and do whatever it wants. 
you're getting big blooms, your um, paper is probably just a little bit too dry. All right, so let's redo that same thing, but let's wait for it to settle in a little bit more. So let's not put quite as much water. Um, it's still super shiny. And now let's try that again. Take a little bit of that. It's still moving a little bit, but not quite as much. Let's put a little bit of that yellow in too. And then we're going to do it again. That same thing. But we're going to wait until um, the paper is more mattified when we hold it up to the reflection. So I'm actually going to suck up a little water so we don't have to wait quite as long. So if I hold this up, see how you can actually see the texture through a little bit more? I need to wait for another second to add that on because in certain areas it's still a little bit too shiny. But we're getting closer to where we need to be. And then when I add this, that bloom is going to be way more controlled. It's not going to move quite as much. Let's do the same thing here. And then let's play around with, again, I'm going to add water here. And I'm going to let it soak in maybe um, just a little bit more. So it's going to be like where you can barely tell that it's shiny. See how you're like, oh, I think it's shiny. And if we add in that color here, it might move. In certain areas, it's going to be more dry. So you're going to have more kind of distinct shapes that are going to stay. All right, so let's review that real quick. You're still on the clouds. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna revisit them in a second as well. But this one I had just freestanding water. It was just flowing across the page. And notice that it kind of all bled together and in some of those areas, it just really mixed in kind of a weird color. Um, this one was Real shiny, but it had started to soak in a little bit, and you can see it's starting to mix in the middle. It really spread super far. This one, I had it where it was kind of mattified, and you still got a nice spread. You can't necessarily see any of the individual brush strokes that I put. It was a little wetter over here, so it, it did spread a little bit more. And then if you wait while it's still just a little damp, um, you're going to be able to see your individual placements of your brush. So this is a really, really good thing to practice. Um, and this is one of those things where you probably will need to practice so that you can understand what your paper looks like when you get it different amounts of wet in order to get different amounts of effects so that you can actually kind of control how much they're going to mix together and things like that. And it's also kind of hard to tell you how much and how long to wait because it's really going to vary on the paper you have, the paints you have, and also the brushes you're using. So using the supplies you have, I would take a piece of paper and just play with this. Yes, struggling with working fast enough for wet on wet washes on whole pages. Oh my goodness. Again, that's just going to be a practice thing because you're going to have to know your timing. You're going to have to know how fast you can move. Things like that. Okay, so we talked about on this one, because another way to shadow clouds... Um, you could attempt, while this was wet, to do some similar things towards the bottom, but you might get some unintended effects, and it, it's not going to move anywhere where you put that, where you sucked up the water anyways. So one option you have for shadowing the bottoms of clouds is to wait till it's dry. This is nice and dry now. Then I'm going to take a wet brush, and I'm going to grab just a little bit of this kind of gray color here. I'm going to tap my brush off because I don't want too much of that on there. And then when it's dry, you could actually come in and just kind of intentionally layer on the bottoms to do some shadowing. You could also kind of tap it in to get a little more shadow there. And then you could use that same kind of paper towel technique to soak up some 
so that you get a little bit of softening on that and that's going to allow you to do some kind of shadowing afterwards. So even if you didn't shadow initially, this is a great way to add in some shadows to get a little more depth and dimension. You live in Colorado. <laughs> I do too. Yes. So one thing you can do is actually pre-wet your, like, wet your entire page first. Let that completely soak in and then start again by wetting your page. If you live in a really dry area, it'll kind of condition the paper so that it actually is like somewhat moist through and it'll slow the entire drying time. Sure. Okay, so there's a question to show that again. So if I wanted to add in an, like some shadowing here on some of these clouds, um, this is a dry painting. I added some onto this one. I was kind of light. Then I'm going to take just a little bit of this um, gray color. And I kind of want my brush to be not super duper wet because I want to have a little more control. Then I can come in right on the bottom and do some kind of that like little shadowing on the very bottom of things. If I wanted to add texture onto it, I could just kind of tap this on to add in some shadowed texture and then use the paper towel to kind of blot on and lift up and that will kind of soften some of that to get a little bit of shadowing. Of course. Okay. So let's take a look at the questions we had. Yeah, okay, that's what you meant by control. Um, more water is less control. Yes, absolutely. Um, so that's exactly the point. If you have no water, where I place the stroke is where it is going to stay. If I have some water, it's going to spread a little bit. If I have a lot of water, it's going to spread to wherever it wants to go. I did use a towel to get the um, cloud to begin with. You can also use your brush um, or anything mildly absorbent. So let's revisit this one real quick. So this is the one where somebody said, what happens if you um, don't put it at an angle and you do the drip line technique? Can you see how there's some kind of strange areas where it's darker here? And then we definitely got blooming where that um, water eventually started to settle. And so you can kind of get some of the same effects, but it's just not going to be quite as flat. Um, so the way that I did the clouds was I just literally did a flat wash and then I took a paper towel, not in some of my hair apparently, and then I just tapped it and lifted it while it was still wet. Okay, so let me take a look. Um, you know what? Let's go on to next controlling blooms because I do I do love a good bloom. All right, I'm going to flip this over. And um, this is actually, I just made a YouTube video on this, so you can see that there too, but I'm going to do the same thing here. So... Controlling blooms, I love using blooms as a practical effect for adding in like highlights and things like that. But in order to actually do that, you need to kind of know, again, very similar to what we're talking about with the amount of wetness that you want on the page. So let's play around with this. Same name on YouTube, yes. So a bloom, for anybody who is curious, a bloom is like the cousin to the back run. They're basically the same thing. That's that separation of the color where it kind of forces some of those weird edges and kind of finger-like textures. And in watercolor, um, uh, they typically call back runs where it was kind of more unintentional, where it was at the very bottom and where you just had a settling of more water. And then as it dries and this dry area dries faster, it kind of back runs into your painting. Whereas a bloom is typically placed intentionally. And... Um, it's where you're actually going to, in the middle, rather than kind of along one of the edges or things like that, you're going to be dropping in water 
once it's a certain level of dry in order to force some of that pigment away and get kind of an intentional effect on that. So let's play with that. Okay, let's do leaves later too. All right, I'm adding this to my little notebook. You're gonna go get a snack now? <laughs> well, you, you did get your clouds too, so um, yeah. So let's mix up another color. What color do you guys want me to um, experiment with the blooms with and I can mix up a fun color? Let me know in the comments. A green, a purple. Oh no, everybody wants different things. <laughs> All right, I think there were a couple, there's a couple purples, couple greens. Let's let's mix up greens and purples because those look nice together. We can do some other colors in a little bit. I like the idea of the pink, but um, one thing we can actually talk about today is non-staining versus staining. If you guys want me to talk a little bit about that, because um, the pink ones don't have as good of blooms because they're typically more staining colors. How can white in be useful in watercolor? So there's a couple schools of thought on using white in watercolor. In general, um, the goal of watercolor is you want to use the white of the paper and keep it that way. Um, so you can either just avoid areas to keep it white. You can use something like a masking fluid. Um, some people will tell you never use white in watercolor that like it's like the cardinal sin of watercolor. I don't really care. Um, at the very end of a painting, if you just think it's going to be a little improved by putting a little bit of white gouache onto it, go for it. My actual favorite way for if you are doing that is to get one of these little white gouache pens because you've got better control and placement of it. And I feel like this is more opaque than what the white gouache that's included in a lot of sets. There's a lot of variety on how actually opaque it is. So yeah, there's, you can use um, this for a lot of different effects. I don't typically paint with it um, in my actual paintings. It's just not something that, like, in, like I don't put it in, in a layer or something like that because you can just use the paper for it. So it seems simpler for me to use that. But if I, at the end of a painting, I will add um, a little bit of white to kind of lighten certain areas if I need to bump up the contrast. Yeah, so I had a gel pen and it did not work super well and I found that gouache pen and I love it. All right, we're gonna take a little aside here. So here's my gel pen, or sorry, that's my gouache pen. And here's the gel pen. So if I try to cover an area with this gel pen, I am actually depositing some white on there, but you can barely see it. And then this one, I bought this on Amazon, and I do have a link. I've got like an affiliate link on my site, but if you just want to search for gouache pen, and then this is what it looks like. So here is the gouache pen next to it. I'm not being super careful, but you can see how much extra coverage it actually has. So, and gouache is spelled, well, this looks like it says Kouache, but <laughs> this should be a G-O-U-A-C-H-E. Guache. That's one of those words where it's kind of fun to interpret how you how you like. It's kind of like Worcestershire. I refuse to say that right. Your favorite medium. Hi. Hi, Snaily Poo. <laughs> I swear, I, I, I know. I know that's not what it says. It's just it's everything that I think of. Plus, I loved your little portraits of yourself. Gouache is your enemy. <laughs> Anem anemone? Oh my gosh, I can only say that. I think I get the Worcestershire from my grandma. She can never say that word right. I mean, she's like the very typical grandma who can't pronounce anything right. But she also does really cute things, like she abbreviates words in unexpected ways. Like, instead of calling the refrigerator the fridge, she calls it the refridge. And that always cracks me up. I don't know why, but it does. 
Okay, back <laughs> on to the subject. What was I doing? I was mixing up a purple and a green. So again, there were a bunch of questions at the beginning. If you missed the beginning of class and you're like, how do I mix up colors? This is the very basic intro. The first thing is, if you have your colors here, you do want to make sure that they are at least a little damp. So I need to respray mine because mine have started to get a little more. Oh, thank you. Then we want to put in a little bit of water into one of these wells. Um, and I just like to use a spray bottle. And then all you're going to do is just take a damp, clean brush, swirl it around on your color. It's going to pick up some pigment in the brush. Then you just swirl it around into that water. Then you want to take like a little tester strip or a little area on your paper and test it because it's going to look way different. Do you use, do I use black watercolor? Is that frowned upon? Um, the answer is, do I use it? Yes and no. In a lot of my paintings, I do not use black to shadow things. I'll use like the complementary color. So if it's like a lemon, I'll use a little bit of a, a purple to shadow it. Um, but that also kind of depends on the style you're painting, because sometimes when I'm doing more graphic style stuff or I'm doing more kind of abstracted, where I just really, really want to force a lot of contrast, then yeah, absolutely use black watercolor. But that doesn't mean that you have to dip straight into the black. You can also just mix up your own black color. All right, let's actually check that. So we've got that. I want, I need it to be a little bit darker in order to make sure I get some really good um, blooms, invisible blooms. And if you teach yourself how to mix up black, that doesn't mean you have to always use a black you've mixed up, but you're going to unintentionally teach yourself a lot about color and it will be really helpful to you in the future. So I do recommend trying it because you might learn a little something about color that you didn't anticipate. And oftentimes doing things is just so much easier to learn things than trying to like sit down and read about why certain colors do certain things. Oh, I'm glad it's useful. Yes, I still, I need to do some updating because I've actually found a simple, a simpler way to make a black with my palette. And I just use that blue raspberry with that marmalade and that makes a really nice black. Two colors to make a black or it's, I mean, it's like a grayish black, but whatever. It's watercolor. All right, so I've got a purple and then let's mix up a green just so we have that ready to go. Same thing as before. You've used, you've used black on clothes and eyes. Yeah, that makes sense. It really depends on the artist. Um, I very first art class I took was a, was a decent art class, but it was really expensive. And it also was one of those ones where it had a lot like first watercolor class I took. It had a lot of rules and, um, you should do this. You can't do that. And I'm a firm believer in do what works for you and what makes you happy. So, you know, your art is going to be a lot of times most enjoyed by you. So, if you want to use black and you're enjoying the process of using it, then absolutely. The paint's gray from that guide. Okay, yes, I need to update that for sure. I can also show you in just a second. All right, so there is a green. Let's get just a little more of that kind of viridian hue. Viridian is a greenish blue or, or bluish green. There we go. All right, so I've got a purple and a green mixed up. We're gonna work on blooms. So again, this is what I was talking about where these are intentional things usually. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna coat an area. You could do this with a blob. Let's do it with a blob. Blobs sound more fun right now. I don't know why. All right, so I've got this completely coated. Since I'm gonna be adding in a bloom, it doesn't really matter if it is accidentally, um, I 
kind of don't get an even wash. I'm going to grab a little of this extra water that's running here while I'm waiting for some of this to suck up. Then I'm going to wash my brush. I'm going to tap it so that it's, I want it like in between kind of dry and wet. And then I'm in certain areas, like can you see the lighter areas here? It's a little more dry there. If I just tap my brush here, that's where it's going to just push that away. Let's bring this up a little closer. Oops. If I tap in those areas, now if I take some, the same amount of water and I tap in one of these wetter areas here, not as much is going to happen, but it has a slightly different effect. Take some of that away. And that's how I do blooms. Now, the other thing you can do with that is I can dip into a little of this purple and then on the inside of one of these, I can force a little purple bloom. I mean, you can kind of do it here. It won't completely mix, but it's gonna mix a little bit, but you can actually kind of do blooms within blooms. All right, let's do blooms on blooms on blooms. And I'm going to put a bloom inside of the, pur the purple, which is inside of the green, which is inside of the bloom. So yeah, you can just kind of play around with this and just see how fun that texture is that that makes. A lot of times we're trying to avoid this. Like, let's say I just accidentally, oh no, I dripped on it. That's going to create a bloom that maybe you didn't intend on. But most of the time, these are very intentional things that you place into your artwork. You've got the same palette. Yeah, they do get a little bit muddy together, but I just I just kind of go with it. All right, let's do that same exact thing again using the purple. So see where I dripped? That was like way too much, so it kind of ruined some of those bloom effects. So I won't drip on the next one. It's not working for you. So describe what is happening so that I can try to troubleshoot it. All right, let's make this blob. I'm making sure this is pretty evenly wet. Pushing that around. Cleaning my brush off. That's what you can hear there. Then my brush is super wet, so I'm gonna just lightly tap it just a little bit because I don't wanna add too much, but I don't wanna completely dry it off. Then I can just Push that in there. If you need a little extra water, you can grab a little extra. And certain colors are going to work better or worse for making blooms. So you can also play around with that if you're like, it's just not working. These ones are a little less defined for me. All right, so there's a couple questions here that are pretty... <laughs> Modeling doesn't affect your art. <laughs> yeah, it, it is hard, especially when you get a nice new palette to like be okay with it muddling. Man, it is difficult. So the, um, the, there's a question that it's like, it's not picking up the paint. So we're not necessarily picking up the paint. What we're doing is we're just depositing water on it and we're pushing the um, paint pigment around. So we're trying to force it with some water. So um, don't think of it as picking up the paint. You want to think of it as pushing it. And rough paper, rough smooth paper can make this rough or smooth or the type of paper. Let me grab a different type of paper for you so you can see something. All right, so this is a very, very different type of paper. This is a hot press paper, and it doesn't really have any texture on it. So let's try to make, um, I don't personally really like this paper, so I don't mind if I use some of this for this purpose. The other thing that's different about this, now, if you are working with arches and you're trying to get blooms, it can be really frustrating because arches is a really forgiving paper. That cotton holds onto that water and that pigment for a lot longer. So you're going to have to be a little more patient to do this. Um, but let's try this on this nice 
kind of thin paper and see what happens. Or not thin paper. This is 140 pound and this is hot, so it's a smooth paper. So let's make a little blob here. Get it kind of the sim similar coverage. And then let's try to do this. So see, we are getting a little blooming, but it's definitely less pronounced than there. It's a bit different. So you're going to see different effects depending on the type of paper and things like that that you're using. And everyone told me I should do infomercials. <laughs> I was just in a silly, goofy mood. <laughs> This is pretty useful. Oh, somebody asked me if it was magnetic. I don't think it is magnetic. But I was surprised. I saw this little thing, and it was like 14 bucks, which is not super cheap, but it was cheaper than I thought it would be. And, I mean, I can use it for hanging my pictures and a bunch of other stuff that I do as well. So um, I actually saw a thing that people said that they use this often for hand lettering, which is pretty cool. Because then you don't have to make any marks or anything on your paper. Um, the paper I am currently using here is 140 pound uh, Canson XL. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about is why would you use blooms? Like, let's let's actually see an example of how they can be practically useful. All right, so let me find some more paper. Um, oh, I'm experimenting with making these little notebooks. Let's let's paint in this one. So. This one is um, Michael's 140 pound, like student grade paper. And instead of working from those little wells, we're gonna work directly from the palette on this one. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm going to paint a little like grapefruit here. And then I'm gonna use one of those blooms in order to make the highlight. You got schooled the other day for calling it arches. <laughs> Says it's French. Arch. Arches. <laughs> Man, in, in painting, there are so many different um, words that have different origins. And it, it is, it's interesting because you learn a little bit about some different languages. But uh, I know when I first started, I, it's one of those weird things where when everything is named something that's not like a typical name and has different pronunciation, it makes even talking about some of this really, really intimidating um, because you're thinking, well, I can't pronounce that and I'm going to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Just do your best, you know, with pronunciations and uh, just go for it because every almost everybody struggles with pronunciation pronunciating, oh my god, pronouncing <laughs> different words. Okay, so the sponges in the palette are meant to kind of help control the moisture on your brush, things like that. I don't usually use them. Um, I guess I guess you can just take them out and wash them and things like that, but they're not something I use. You could also technically take it out and then use it to lift with... Um, so you could get creative with how you use those. <laughs> you usually say you speak in pictures. Oh my goodness, I, my husband's had to like learn my little language. A lot of what I do is go like, we need to and, and do that. And then he's kind of learned what I mean by some of that. All right, so anyways, we're back to painting something practical. This is gonna be kind of like a grapefruit orangey type thing. Um, depending on the colors that I ultimately decide to put down. I'm going to be painting directly from here, letting the colors actually mix on the page so you can see it's something a little bit different. So I'm going to start with some of this kind of orange color. It's a nice color. Let's put a little bit of this kind of pink color into it. Oops, that was not as magenta as I thought it was going to be. So let's mess with that some more. There we go, that's the magenta one. That's like my one complaint with this palette is I feel like some of the colors are kind of out of order. Let's put some yellow in here. A 
Let's add in a bit of a, a shadow by putting in a little purple at the kind of bottom here. And then here is where I would use a bloom. I would wash my brush, take a damp brush, and then I would just kind of tap this in right here. And look at that, a nice highlight is going to kind of form. It's gonna have some interesting texture too as it dries, because it's gonna have some of those kind of like finger type, type things. Let's see. Do watercolors ever mold or expire? Um, yeah, like somebody is saying, it kind of depends on the environment you're in. Um, Colorado, for example, there is a less likely chance because we are a super dry um, environment. So we don't have a ton of molds here. Like we don't have to worry quite as much about things like mold in our bathroom and whatnot as you would in a really humid environment. The key is, yes, letting these dry out completely. The other thing you could do if you're worried about it is you could paint with like um, distilled water or something like that so that you're not introducing um, more of that in there. But letting them dry before you close them up is going to. There are also some that are, um, depending on the quality control, uh, I will just tell you guys because I, I was going to make a video about this and I decided not to. But in some of my art kits that I send out, I was testing to, I bought a bunch of these Arteza watercolor tube paints to be able to send out some different kits. And um, thankfully, I, I let them dry and I closed them up. And um, thankfully, right before I shipped them out, I looked. And in two of the colors, just two of the colors, not all of them, but they all had mold on them. So it can also be a... Um, quality control issue. So I, I don't recommend Arteza tube watercolors, just FYI. Yeah, so that is that is a really good point. Um, and it's also a really good point to um, pay attention to some of those small details. Like I live in Colorado, so it's a dry environment. So some of the ways that my paints are going to move are going to be a little different than the way that your paints are going to move because I'm, mine are going to dry a lot faster than if you live in somewhere where there's a lot of humidity. Which also makes it a good idea to follow like a couple different um, um, watercolor type teachers because they're all going to have some slightly different things. All right, let's let's. I'm going to um, paint a little. I feel like this this needs a leaf. I'm going to put a bloom in the leaf too. All right, so we have time for I think one more troubleshooting thing. I placed this in a weird spot, so the uh, little orange. You were trying to do plain air stuff in a swamp. Oh my goodness. That sounds difficult to say the least. I'm going to put a little extra color in this. All right, I like that better. So what do I prefer painting with the color straight from the palette or mixing my own? That really, really depends on what I'm painting. Um, when I'm doing landscapes and stuff, I mix a lot of my own. And when I'm doing like more free flowing things like fruits and stuff, I like to dip into here. Again, you're probably going to find certain things that you like to use each method for. Can't get my palette in Canada yet. I know, I'm sorry. Um, good starter. The koi ones are pretty good. Um, if and also kind of depends on your budget. If you're, if you're on a bit of a budget, I recommend the praying ones over um, like the Crayola ones. These actually work pretty darn good. This little praying set, I think. And it came with a decent brush. It wasn't the best brush, but it was one that I wouldn't just toss like right away. Like it would actually be pretty useful. 
Um, and I think this was like eight or nine dollars and it has a lot of colors in it. Yeah, good starter palettes. Um, the Koi. Koi is a good one. I like mine as a good starter palette, but again, that's a very biased opinion, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, I'm trying to think, what are the other good ones? Windsor & Newton isn't bad. It's not one of my favorites. I actually like the Koi better than that one. This Prang one is pretty good as far as a starter one. I mean, anything you get is going to be just fine. Like, just learn how to play with it, and it will also help you kind of appreciate when, once you do need to replace your palette. You got a schmick set. Uh, they're expensive. I was told to get just to get fewer colors. Yes, I think that is, if you're trying to up the quality of your paints, the key is... Um, having some good base colors because you can mix up pretty much any color you want to. Snow is difficult. Oh my God, it is. Um, uh, I don't have any ideas for that. I struggle with that all the time. <laughs> you got the Sennelier one. I don't know how to pronounce that. I have that one too. Um, I actually thought that one was pretty expensive. I think it's a really nice set. And if that's within your budget, yes, absolutely go for it. But I'm always hesitant to recommend super expensive ones because I know there are a lot of younger people here on, on this page as well. And so you might, you know, this might be your first 10 bucks you've got to spend on something or whatever. So um, I, I hesitate to recommend super expensive palettes that are cause like the ones I bought one as a Christmas present and it was a pretty small one. It was like almost 50 bucks and I like it, but that's a, I don't know that. I, I grew up in a family where, you know, we, we didn't have a ton of disposable income when I was growing up. So I was a little sensitive to that. Okay, um, wait, wait, I'm going to do one more thing so you guys can tell me what you want me to, to do. Do you want me to show leaves? Was there something else that I missed that you want me to show? we got like 10 minutes. I can also play around with a little more color control when you're working kind of wet on wet too. Leaves. All right, let's do some leaf stuff. So the, the um, blooms, yes, they are going to expand and it's also going to depend. I, so I left mine obviously kind of drying at an angle. So they moved down a little bit. So they do expand as they dry. And depending on how your paper buckles and things like that, um, it's going to affect it. So one of the, th the questions earlier too was, what do you do about trying to make your paper not buckle? In general, it's going to buckle. There are a bunch of different ways to solve it. Um, but they only work to a degree. So the main thing you want to do is just while it is buckling is kind of be cognizant of how you place it at what angles to dry. All right, let's do, let's make some leaves here. Okay, so let's start with the super duper basics. Um, this is a really good thing to learn how to do is even if you don't have a super great brush, you're going to be able to be able to play around with how much pressure you put on it, any sort of a round brush. So the tip, there was somebody asking about good brushes. I always recommend getting like a size 10 or 12 because you really only need one brush. You want it to be a round brush that has a super nice point. Um, again, I am biased. This is a brush that I had made, um, but you could buy whatever one you found in there. Just look for it having a super nice tip on it and you want it to have a little bend, um, not too much. Now, something like this, if you're in the market to kind of like go up to the next level and you've been painting for a while, this is the silver black velvet one. And I do really like this brush, although it moves way more than this one. And so it's more for once you want to like let go of some control. Um, but if you were a beginner and you were trying to paint with this, it's going to go kind of all over. I mean, you could definitely learn on this, but it's also a more expensive brush. So that's why I 
typically say save this one for once you're like, ooh, I've got this down. Okay, so let's let's paint a couple little leaves here. Um, all we're really going to do for leaves, for very basic leaves, is we're going to meet the tip of the paper, tip of the brush to the paper, and we're going to pull while we make a um, pre we're going to pressure put pressure on our brush. Oh my goodness! So we go from the tip. We pull while we're pushing down to put pressure, and then we're going to slowly lift, and that's going to make us a very basic leaf. This is for like a long type leaf. If you wanted to vary this type of leaf a little bit, like you wanted a little bit um, to be a little bit rounder at the bottom, you're going to want to practice making these little C shapes. So you start the same way, you take the tip of the brush. But then we're going to push while we kind of go out to one side and make a C shape. Kind of like a banana. Then we're going to do the same thing on the other side. And you can either do this where you're going to meet these. You can also leave that part intentionally or just fill in a little bit. Sometimes that's a nice way to kind of serve as that center line highlight. Here, let's do one where we close it up. All right, fern leaves. Oh my goodness. Let's see if I can think this through. I've got to try to mentally picture a fern. So a fern leaf, um, you know, they have kind of like a stem here, like they, they, and they stem out. They're going to start off, in general, the shape. I'm going to grab a pencil. Hold on. I'm trying to think. Okay, so... Don't they usually have one that kind of comes out like this? They're like real. They're going to kind of come out. This is going to be the general shape. Oh my goodness. The answer to your question on can I paint fern leaves is I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm not even sure I remember what they look like. Let me move it in this direction. Sometimes changing the direction helps me visualize it a little bit more. Um, okay, so if I were to, I can kind of picture this. So a fern leaf is like, they've got a whole bunch of little leaves, right? So that you would come in and kind of, this is not, this is not going to look like a fern. I'm going to just pre-apologize. <laughs> Um, hold on. I, I'm going to Google a fern because very clearly this is, hopefully you guys are laughing at me well, or laughing with me because I'm laughing too. So ferns. <laughs> Okay, I was kind of close in what I was imagining. I was not that close, though. Okay. Oh, man, I see why you're wanting to know about this, because it is a complicated... Um, for those of you who I'm sure... I'm sure everybody's like, yeah, I know what a fern leaf looks like. You're the only one. They can look like a lot of different things, but I was kind of thinking of one like this, where they have a bunch of different shapes on them. Um... You could also picture something like one of these, which is a little more simplified, which would maybe be an easier one to start with. So let's let's kind of simplify this a little bit. So in general, um, the two different things with the fern leaves, one was, um, so one when we actually looked at it, the shape was kind of like, had that stem type thing and then in general it had these shapes that were kind of like this but then you could just feather out the sides this is the real simple one I haven't had a lot of time to think about this obviously since I didn't even remember what a fern looked like um, and then just kind of make those little like leaf type shapes I'm just gonna kind of feather the sides
This is when I'm going to um, highly encourage you to um, do a little Google search because I bet there are about 50 YouTube videos that are going to explain this better and know way more what they're talking about. But something like that would kind of give you the beginning effects of the fern leaf. Um, for more like those Boston ferns, what we were seeing there. Uh-oh. I've got mine glued to my palette because that was a little bit wet. You'd want to um, vary the colors you're using a little bit. So they did have a center stem that was more of kind of a brown color. So let's just grab some of this. I've got a little bit too much in my palette. That's also a good idea if you're having trouble controlling how much is in your brush to just kind of tap off every once in a while. And then let's just kind of start like that. Tiny evergreen, yeah, that's probably a good idea. You run out of custom color, you mixed the you're just going to have to try to mix it up again. Um, or at least come up with one that's kind of similar. But that's another good reason to have these little tester strips because then you can kind of mix and then test right next to it to see how close you are. All right, so um, the only thing I can kind of think of to suggest for these fern leaves is when you're doing this is remember that they do kind of move. So I would kind of vary the um the shape of them a little bit because some are going to be a little twisted some aren't just kind of place them close together i know this is not that helpful but something like that Encourage some. The other thing to do is when you're selecting um, one of the big quote unquote mistakes that I see beginners make. I don't even know if I would call this like a it's not a true mistake. But um, when you're selecting an image. So first of all, if you are working off of images, you typically don't want to do a Google search like this because these can be copyrighted images. You want to go on to something that's got like a royalty free thing. But um, when you are selecting images, like let's say it's your very, very first painting and like may maybe you're a absolute wizard at this. And so you're going to be totally fine doing something super complicated like this. But what you might want to do is look for more simplified ones. So when you're looking for images, like if I were to try to paint this right here, I need to understand how to do shadowing. I need to know how to do some of these kind of backfill areas. I have to know how to preserve white areas. I need to understand the movement of this leaf in a whole bunch of different directions and all the shapes it's going to make. Um, whereas if I were to do something more like this, where it's a little more simplified, I'd at least start to get to know the shape of the leaf. So when you're looking for reference photos, if you're starting, look for something that has simple shapes where there's not a ton of this overlapping, like maybe challenge yourself to have a little bit in it. Um, but if you start off with everything is overlapping, everything's in a different perspective, you're probably going to get frustrated and never finish that. Whereas if you start with something like this, a little more simple, you're going to maybe get a little frustrated, but you're going to learn a little bit. Then maybe you can kind of step up to a slightly more complicated one and kind of build yourself up. Set yourself up for success rather than frustration. So um, there's somebody in there saying you can use copyright images, but you have to change them. I mean, you absolutely can. And especially if you if you do need to do like just a Google search, what I typically like to do is select a whole bunch of the images in order to kind of take an amalgamation. But there are some really, really beautiful 
um, royalty free set sites. My favorite is Unsplash. Let me write that out so you can see it. It's just unsplash.com, and there are some really cool photographers on there. And you're allowed to use theirs. They do recommend that you kind of give them a little shout out if you if you don't change it too much, kind of a thing. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I totally forgot about that. The black. Okay. So one very last thing we're gonna to touch on, and then I do need to run is mixing your own black. So you can actually see I've already mixed up some here. Um, but let's also do a little experiment here. Okay, let me grab this little tester strip. So this is just going to be straight black over here. We're going to pull that from the Stuart Simple palette. And then this, this is going to be the... Um, where we mix it up. Okay, so let's say you have a palette that has black. That's great. All right, we've got a black color there. Now, this one technically is a little more brown leaning. So this is kind of the funny thing that when we learn how to mix up black, um, you're going to start to notice a few different things. This, this actually, now that we all kind of wear black leggings, you probably notice that some of your blacks don't match. Like some of them have different undertones. And so that is one of the benefits of learning how to mix up your own black color is you'll be able to control the undertones of it. So if you wanted your whole painting to kind of be cool, you could do more of a blue type black. If you want it to be warmer, something like this would be a really good black to put in there. Okay, so... Um, let me, I don't have any more clean on my palette, of course, so let's just pull this here. I need to pre-wet these. So this is my own palette here um, that I have made and listed on my website. And so one of the questions was they were struggling. My initial, the way I kind of did these is I don't include a black or a brown because you can mix all those colors up. And so I want to encourage you to learn a little bit about that. Um, it's hard to mix up your own super vibrant color. So I'd rather give you vibrant colors than one that, isn't, you know, um, when you can mix it up. Uh, but part of it is that I have a little color mixing guide. It's like a little menu kind of thing. So easiest way I have found with this set, you know, I started this off by kind of trying to go more of a traditional route with actually mixing it black. So it was a much more complicated recipe, but my new favorite way to do it is I just take a little of this blue raspberry color. This is kind of like a phalo blue. Let's put a little of that in there. I'm going to wash my brush off so I don't contaminate my other colors. Then I'm going to grab some of this blue raspberry color. This is kind of like a phalo blue. Let's put a little of that in there. I'm going to wash my brush off so I don't contaminate my other colors. Then I'm going to grab some of this marmalade, which is kind of like a uh, orange or kind of a vermilion color. Mix those two together. Now, if I keep it like this, where there is a little more of that kind of orange in it, it can be a brown. But if I take a little more of this blue to mix in, it might be enough. Now we've got more of a warm black. If I take just a teeny tiny bit more. And I do have some water in my brush, so this is definitely thinning this down. But now I can have kind of a cool phalo blue. Or not phalo blue, um, Payne's gray kind of a color. So you can see how much variation, depending on the concentrations of each color, you can get with just two colors. And then just as the final word of wisdom, the reason why this happens is when you mix all the different colors together, that's when you actually get a black color because they all, all the brightnesses in the other ones cancel each other out. So if we think about this, um, when I say all the colors, we're, we're kind of meaning everything around the color wheel. And so when we actually look at these colors, this blue has a little bit of green in it, which means it probably has a little bit of kind of, um, it's also kind of a nice deep blue, so it might have some other colors in it. And this one is an orange that is a little red leaning. So when we mix these two together, we're actually kind of mixing yellow, red, orange, green, and blue together.
And you'll, put, you'll be able to do kind of a similar thing with your different colors as well in your palettes. You finally found the page of mixing. Yeah, I'm doing some, I'm going to try to do some improvements to my website. I'm also going to be putting any of the videos, big long videos I make for YouTube um, up as articles too, in case you learn a little differently. I have not experimented with liquid coal. I don't even know what that is. I'll have to look it up. All right. I need to um, head out for the day, but... I appreciate everybody for joining. If you want to show me any of your art or anything like that, please feel free to tag me in videos, send me pictures on Instagram. I appreciate your time today, and I will see you guys again next week. Have a great, great, great weekend or evening or wherever you are. Yes, thank you, thank you.